Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1292 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday evening into Monday. Thank you for joining us, as always, on the podcast. Make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out on, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts across the board. Today's episode is actually part two of three with Bill DeFilippo, my friend from Dime and Uprock Sports. If you missed it over the weekend, we dropped part one. Bill joined me for a long conversation about the Eastern Conference. If I could Kind of by divisions in some respects. The first podcast, which covered the Atlantic Division, covered kind of what's going on there compared to the Hawks, etc. Today's part two episode is going to be the Central Division, which of course includes the Bucks and the Cavs, the Bulls, etc. And then we'll save part three for tomorrow. That'll be dropping on Monday evening into Tuesday, which of course covers the Southeast Division, headlined by the Atlanta Hawks. So stay tuned for all of that coming up. Bill's very smart. We cover the NBA together, and that's a fun podcast that I think you'll definitely enjoy. Again, please subscribe to the show. We'll have more Hawk Center content later on this week and into next week. The doldrums here are here, but we're never going to go anywhere on this podcast. We're always here two, three, four times per week, even in the off season. So please stay tuned. Tell a friend about the podcast after the intro. We'll come back with myself and Bill. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Bill, we're still recording. This is part two of our extended conversation about the Eastern Conference. Welcome back. And uh, this episode is going to center on the Central Division. And uh, I don't know. It's interesting. There, there are not as many teams in this division that have, like, giant uncertainty. In fact, all five of these teams have over-unders on the board. We're making progress, Bill. <laughs> Finally. Five teams where we have a general idea of what's going to happen. <laughs> Basically so. So... As we've done the first episode, by the way, if you listen to part one, uh, that should, if you did not listen to part one, I should say, that's still available for you. This is a, a podcast about the Central. And uh, because of that, we're going to start with the team that is very clearly the best in the Central. That is the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, Milwaukee's over under actually opened a little bit lower. It's been bet up to the point where they are almost at the same level as Boston. They have a 53 win projection at Bet Online. And uh, we talked about this before we started recording, but I think that people have almost forgotten this. Uh, Milwaukee very well might have won the series last year had they had Chris Middleton, who is arguably yeah. their second best player, might be their third best player, but still, um, that's kind of just been like forgotten that they didn't have him in that series uh, because I guess Giannis is such a freak and they still they still almost won the series regardless, uh, even with, even without Middleton. But like Middleton's back, they're pretty good. Yeah, that that game against the Celtics, like they ended up losing uh, by twenty. Eight, I believe, if my math is correct. I'm, I'm bad at math. Uh, I, yeah, they lost by 28 points uh, with Giannis having 25 points, 20 rebounds, nine assists, two steals, and a block. And like you mentioned, the forgotten point of that was that game was really close at halftime. I believe Boston was up by like two or something like that. And then, you know, Grant Williams, you know, just Grant Williams and Peyton Pritchard just made a bunch of threes that – Milwaukee for all intents and purposes let them take and that didn't happen if Chris Middleton was healthy there's a really good chance that we're talking about the two-time defending NBA champion Milwaukee Bucks right now because like I I don't know about you Brad I think that Boston's moves during the offseason might make them the best team in the east but I find it really hard to bet against the Milwaukee Bucks and if we get to next June and the Bucks are lifting the Larry O'Brien trophy and Giannis, you know, has one trophy in this hand and the finals MVP in this hand, like I'm going to sit here and go, yeah, sure. That sounds about right. Bill, if I ask you what you think these, uh, the Bucks shot in that series against, against Boston, what I just remind everybody else, Milton didn't play the entire series. He missed the entire series. Um, if I ask you what they shot from three as a team, what would you guess? Well, one thing I remember from that series was uh, Drew Holiday was far more willing to shoot than he's ever been in his life. He shot a lot, um, yes. And it didn't work out very well. I will guess they shot 29% from three. They shot 27.9% from three. They had a 49.6% true shooting percentage in the series as a team. Uh, Chris Middleton would have helped that, I would guess. Yeah, considerably. Uh, obviously, that's only it's only one, it's only a seven-game sample size. I, I'm not saying that. I don't want to overstep that either, but... Um, Needless to say, I, I agree with your point. I think Milwaukee is tough to bet against as long as Giannis is Giannis, and they have something around him. You know, the loss of 
Middleton for that bit of time. You know, Milwaukee's basically said the reason why we're starting here is that they didn't really do anything different. Like they brought in Joe Ingles, who is like they're hoping to help them. Uh, he's hurt at the beginning of the season. He's their only addition. Everything else is basically resign and draft and draftees and draftees are not going to really yeah. help the Celtics. Uh, sorry, the, the, Buc- the Bucks this year. So like it's the same team. It's just that I wanted to say out loud that they they were better than they were in the playoffs because Middleton which wasn't, just wasn't there and they're still really good. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at what they did in free agency. We have it up here. It's Nothing. re-signed, 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 re-signed. Undrafted free agent, drafted number 24th. That was Marjan Bouchamp from uh, the G League Ignite team. Uh, they got a contract extension done with Pat Connaughton, and they signed Joe Ingles, who, you know, he'll play at some point. It just probably won't be until – around maybe around all-star i don't know like just trying to project out these sorts of injuries is like really tough so you look at all of this and it seems like the bet that milwaukee is making is basically what you and i have mentioned chris middleton doesn't get hurt and this team would have won a championship and i can't blame them for making that bet yeah i mean they're plus they're spending so much money and like if the one thing that you could sort of Mm -hmm. quibble with and i think i would is the bobby portis whole thing like I like Bobby Portis, but like they very obviously committed to him in a way that they probably didn't need to a year ago. They could have signed PJ Tucker instead, and that probably would have preferred PJ, to be honest. But like, yeah, that's fair. they're still really good. I mean, they got Wes Matthews for nothing. Uh, that is a huge addition from last year that carries over to this year. I don't know. Milwaukee's kind of is kind of boring because Giannis, Giannis is such a freak, and like he's incredible. I think he's the best player in the world. I really do. Uh, and having him on the team and having two like you know robin level co-stars in drew and chris middleton like that combined with some really good defenders brooke lopez and a good staff etc like they're just the same really good basketball team that won the, won the title two years ago like, and and they go about their business in a way where they just take so much pride in what they do when they go out into the basketball court and oh, yeah. they, they never seem like there's any sense of doubt that ever creeps in there's never seems like there's any sense of complacency that creeps in like you know we look at uh the two teams that lost in the that were in the nba finals the year before lost in a game seven in the exact same round last year and you look at how the bucks lost and it was they went down swinging they went down fighting you know just you know, it just didn't quite work out for them. And never see, like, it didn't seem like anyone was really like, they, uh, they were obviously upset, but it wasn't like existential crisis levels. And then you look at the way the suns went down and that seemed to have unearthed some stuff about how that <laughs> team functioned last season and led to legitimate, you know, if not for the fact that Kevin Durant is extremely available and it seems like the suns are one of the teams that could be a potential destination for him. Lord knows how we're talking about the suns heading into this next year next two years where chris paul's at the you know at the basically the end of his career where deandre ayton is um employed by the suns uh lord knows what has to happen there to get him to a point where he's going to be able to be a positive contributor uh and a guy who's there long term and i think that's you know speaks volumes to what they have in milwaukee and what they've built in that you know it's a war that can be a bit groan inducing, but the culture that they have around that entire Bucks, uh, around that entire Bucks team that stems from having a guy in Giannis who takes so much pride in all that stuff. Yeah, Giannis rules. Uh, I will just say one more thing that is Hawks adjacent. The Bucks uh, hired Damari Carroll as an assistant, uh, which made my heart very warm. Uh, of course, Damari was a was an All Star with the Hawks, basically an All Star level player at one point, um, and I believe leaving free agency. But he was a beloved figure. Obviously, played under Bud. Now he's a coach under Bud. Um, lots lots of Hawks stuff. They still have Charles Lee. It's a very Hawks very Hawksy uh, coaching staff in Milwaukee at this point. But that was a, that was an awesome story that happened last week or this week or whenever we're recording this podcast. But Damari Carroll, baby, he's back in the league. I'm excited. But but if there's one thing Bud loves, it's his guys. Bud loves his guys. Yeah, Dar- Darvin Ham just was there forever until he finally got the Lakers job. Um, you know, Taylor Jenkins is on the Bud staff. That 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 tree is a real tree. I mean, people have almost forgotten about Taylor Jenkins and Kenny Atkinson being with Bud. Um, you know, Quinn Snyder was in the, was on the Hawks staff under Bud for a season or two. It was uh, they've been around for a while. They've got some guys. All right, Bill, we will close the book on the Bucks and move on to the rest of the division. But first, a word from our sponsors on the Pines. 
Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. If you haven't tried the Puffs yet, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor as well, and it's delicious. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to that new flavor, and it's Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunk chunks, and of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate, as all Built Bars are. All the joys of eating cookie dough without all the hassle of having to make it, plus it's actually healthy for you as well. Cookie dough chunk puffs have 160 calories and a whopping 15 grams of protein in them as well. Run to built.com right now, snag a box for yourself and the family. It'll be the perfect treat or you can find a really good hiding place for just yourself, honestly. If you want to just keep them all to yourself, I would not blame you at all for that. Like all built bars, the new chunk puffs are healthy and tasty. What's great about built is that all the bars have collagen protein as well. It helps your body to absorb them more efficiently, and they have a ton of health, health benefits as well. Eat something that tastes good and is actually good for you. You're going to absolutely love the cookie dough chunk puff. Whether you need a snack for your workout, a late night treat, or just to grab something for your quick bite, built is a perfect protein bar across the board, and it tastes better than a candy bar. All of that in a healthy package as well. Grab yourself a built bar today and go to built.com. Use promo code LOCK15 when you get there, 15% off on your order with built bar. One more time, that is promo code LOCK15, 15% off at built.com. <laughs> All right, Bill, let us move on to uh, what looks like, at least according to Bet Online and their over unders, a kind of a two team race for the second spot in the Central between the Bulls and uh, Dime's favorite team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> uh, Shouts to Martin Rickman. Hi, Martin. Um, but yeah, you know, these teams have over unders that are very similar. Chicago's at 44 right now, Cleveland's at 43 right now. Uh, those were a Cleveland was a bit higher. They've actually been bet, been bet down. I'm not really sure why that would be. Or hmm. Maybe the, the Sexton thing is still lingering out there. And he's still, as we're recording this, unsigned. Um, do you have a preference between the Bulls and the Cavs? Because they're very different teams, but they have a similar projection at this point. I would probably prefer the Cavs. And it stems almost entirely from, I'm really worried about Lonzo Ball. I have yeah. no idea what's going on there. I don't think... It they sounds don't. like the Bulls don't even have a good yeah. grasp of what's going on there. But it sounds like he has some really serious issues with his knee. I'm For how much I love DeMar DeRozan, I'm not sure how sustainable what he did last year is. I think Nikola Vucevic is a good player, but he needs to bounce back in a really big way this next year. And then you just kind of look up and down this team and like – Zach Levine just got paid huge money, and I'm a big Zach Levine fan, but outside of him, do I really want to bank on – I think Patrick Williams is a nice player. Do I want to bank on him being the kind of guy who, as a bunch of dudes are going like this, he's going to shoot up so high that it offsets that? Do I want to bet on Io Desunmu, Kobe White, who I think are nice players but might not be guy, you know, or guys who are limited? Same with a guy like Alex Caruso. Javante Green was a nice story. So – you look at all this stuff in Chicago and you look at how in the second half or so of last season, once Ball and Caruso went down, it seemed to really derail things for them. And I'm a little bit skeptical. And then meanwhile in Cleveland, I, I, I don't know what's going on with that Colin Sexton situation. That is a bit of a weird one. I have my cons- – you know, I have some skepticism about Karis Levert as a player, yeah. but otherwise, I love Darius Garland. I love Evan Mobley. I love Jared Allen. I think Laurie Markinen is a nice piece for them. I think Ochai Agbaji is going to be a good player for them probably sooner rather than later. I still have some concern. Part of the reason I think they should probably pay Sexton, Sexton would be wise to take a deal from them. I think they can use a guy next to Garland who can provide a little bit more scoring punch on the perimeter, but I really like what they are building there in Cleveland. And if I have to pick between those two teams, I'm more inclined to take them. What about yourself? Yeah, I I lean Cleveland as well. I think people have kind of forgotten this too. That Like Cleveland was, it was genuinely stunning how good they were last year. They fell fell off late and, you know, part of that was injury based. And of course they didn't look in the, in the play in the Hawks kind of blew through them and, you know, but, they went from being projected as a bad – they were projected to be pretty bad last year. And then yeah. they suddenly were this, like, legitimate top five, top six team in the East for most of the season. They tail off, but, like, this is a, a nice foundation. And you're right. I mean, the three guys they have, Garland, Mobley, Allen, that's a heck of a foundation for them. I think that Sexton would help them. I, I've never been a huge Sexton guy necessarily, but sure. I think that especially when Garland is off the floor, they could really use Sexton. Like, yeah. We saw, I mean, that, that, that was, I guess, the, the theory behind going and getting, getting Karis LeVert was to have him kind of be that guy. 
Uh, Karras is a Michigan guy. I'm not going to pile on. Not my favorite player in the league at this point. But, like, he's just not that good. And he's useful. Like, he, he's got some traits that they can certainly take advantage of. But, yeah, I think that that's a, a pivot point there. They need a Baji to be okay. They just, they just need more shooting. I mean, rookies, I don't like relying on rookies, but he's probably going to play for them just because they're going to need his shooting out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do like them. I think it's more of a bet a little bit against Chicago. And you said, I mean, DeMar, I was wrong about the DeRozan thing. A lot of people were. I was very wrong about that. Um, I, I cannot imagine him doing that again. Like, he, he had the best year of his career by a wide margin at the age of 32. That does not usually happen. Now, could yeah. he do that again? Sure, he could. He, he just did it. We watched him do it. So he, he could do it again. But you got to say, probably not going to be quite that good, you wouldn't think. And, like, yeah, they get, they get Pat Williams for another year. But that's kind of their really only major thing that they did, out, like, for the present. Like, they draft Dale and Terry, who I like a lot. Um, mm-hmm. They bring in Drummond, but, like, that helps them. But the Vooch thing is weird. I don't know. I, I never bought the Bulls thing last year. I never did honestly, all the way through. So that's probably why I'm leaning Cleveland. But listen, these teams are close for a reason. Like a lot of things could happen to change this. Like if Pat Williams is awesome, the Bulls are going to be a lot better than, than I think they're going to be. Um, and for Cleveland, if they have if they have Garland or if Mobley takes another leap and becomes Tim Duncan, like some people think he might be, um, <laughs> uh, that'd be the only way that they, they can do that. So I don't know. Neither one of them I could see touching Milwaukee as long as Giannis is alive. But like there's there, – there are at least two solid play-in teams – if not better yeah. than that. And like there is a grouping that we'll probably touch on at the end. Like there's probably five or five, maybe six lock locks to be like at least in the top 10. And then there's a group between like six and 12. That's kind yeah. of a mess. And I, I do like teams like Cleveland and Chicago better than like Washington and better than like New York. Yes. Like they're, they're better than that, but they're not as good for me as like Toronto or Atlanta. Like that kind of, that's kind of where my tear break is, is after um, probably after Toronto, but we'll see. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's reasonable. I mean, when you look at the East, I would very comfortably take Boston, Philly, Toronto, Milwaukee, Miami yeah. over both of those teams. I would probably take Atlanta over them. Big question mark in Brooklyn, so we won't even worry about that. Yeah, so, Bro- Brooklyn is a giant shrug. I have no idea. I mean, yeah. We talked about it on the last podcast, but they're the one team that it, it depends on t- – because honestly, not to go back to this – but even if Brooklyn, if they trade KD for a package that's not just picks, they'll still be pretty good if they keep Kyrie. Yeah. I, and still- yeah, so I think when you look at Chicago and Cleveland, the thing that they're banking on is we're going to be able to compete for potentially the sixth seed. We're going to be able to sneak into the very back of the playoffs. And if not, we're going to take solace in knowing that we can host a play. We, we will have two shots at making the playoffs. Both of them are going to be, you know, if we get the seven team seed, both of them are going to be in our building. And I think that's fine. I mean, I think, I think it's more fine for Cleveland because Cleveland is probably, you know, their window to be a team that competes for the, an Eastern conference championship is, Five, six years, seven years, whatever say, it is. It's, it's it's a future based thing. Not like they're not yeah. um as much as they were good last year and kind of arrived a year early, the pressure on Cleveland to be like a top, like a contender level team this year is kind of not there. Um yes. Chicago all those guys meanwhile. Are, yeah, to your they have to win now. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the problem with this is that you know, if they had Lonzo, and that's the thing, I, I would be higher on Chicago if they had Lonzo. Same. But and if they have Lonzo and, and Lonzo's Lonzo, that really helps them because he does things that nobody else on that, on that roster does. Like Caruso is a really good defender, but he, he's not the shooter that Lonzo is. Like yeah. Lonzo is the guy that kind of unlocks a lot of different things for them. And if he's not there, they're still fine. But to your point that you're about to make, I think like they don't have the upside. I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. see Chicago's upside on this roster, which is they're, not where you want to be when you're all, when you're kind of all in like money wise. Right. And their entire situation is we basically have, I, I think DeMar is under contract for another two years. Like, once Demar is, they signed Levine too long term, but like, yeah, they need like Levine is really good. He can't be your only guy. I mean, that's right. The theory behind the team now is basically those two guys and whatever else they and then get, and they you know and Vooch reset games. and then reset whenever Vooch and uh, Demar's tenures are done. There, yep. It, it's tough. I will say this, uh, kind of like you mentioned, when they have Caruso and Ball out there. 
the way just those two guys tra- – because I'm never, I'm never going to be too terribly concerned – about their offense. I think Zach Levine's a really good offensive player. I think DeMar's right. a really good offensive player. Vooch is a good defensive center. Offensive the center. The way – offensive <laughs> center. Offensive, offensive. offensive. I know. I know. I, I, know you, I know what you meant. I just want to make sure that, that – that, that. That's one of those ones that we need to make sure we correct. Uh, yes. But the way that those two guys in Caruso and Ball transform, especially their point of attack defense on the perimeter. Like when those two are out there, it just gives you a line of defense on the perimeter – that when you take one of them out and you put in Ayo Sunmu, Kobe White, uh, whomever else you would potentially put out there, that one chain, even if you have the other guy out there, it just falls off entirely. And I think that's like, that's a huge thing for them. And I also like, <laughs> while I admit all of that, I also don't like making that kind of a bet on a guy like Lonzo with his knee injuries and a guy like Caruso who's just, always seems to pick up one of the, you know, last year was a little bit different because it was Grayson Allen, but he's a guy who will miss four or five games here and there with, you know, a little hamstring pull or something like that. Yeah, no, I, this, these are obviously the two teams that can kind of challenge for the playoffs in this division. We'll get to why that other, the other two probably can't in a moment. Maybe, maybe Detroit can get there. We'll see if they have a, a total blow up for the, from the young, from the young guys. If, if K just makes another leap, then maybe they can do it. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, yeah, I, I think that I, I would hear arguments on either side of Chicago and Cleveland. I would probably lean Cleveland as well, just to answer my own question from earlier, unless Lonzo is just healthy and back. If they have Lonzo, I like Chicago better for this year only. Hmm. If they, Interesting. If, okay. if, if, if Lonzo is Lonzo, and by the way, this is a small margin, like, I'm not like staking my you know anything on that, but without Alonzo, I think I would definitely lean Cleveland. If if they have Alonzo, I would maybe lean a little bit further to Chicago, but that's that's a huge if, and I would guess that he's not healthy based on all the all of what we're hearing at this point. Right. What what you're basically saying is Alonzo is the difference between which of these two teams has a has a shot at avoiding the play in. Which yeah, and I even then, that. I mean, I would I am not going to pick barring something weird happening. I am probably not going to have either of them avoiding the play-in in my, in my final projections. I'm That's pretty fair. sure I know what my six is going to be in some order, and it's not going to be either one of those two teams. I think it's going to be Toronto and Atlanta along with the big four, um, at least the theoretical big four. But, yeah, I think I think these teams at least can be looking in the mirror in October and like, all right, we could be the six seed. And that's not it's not that's not unrealistic at all for these teams. You know, Chicago was there last year and Cleveland was there for most of the way and then fell out. They were there. It's just that by the end mm-hmm. – Anybody that watched, as I, as I know you did, that Chicago Milwaukee series, we lost some time in our lives. That was a, a tough yeah. scene for the Bulls. So, yeah. All right. Let us move on to Detroit and Indiana. We'll group them together on some level. But uh, Detroit is, for people like us that are sickos, one of the most interesting teams in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, they are very, very young. And uh, because of that, their over under is, I think, like 27 and a half still, despite a lot of talent on the roster. But just to, put a snapshot on it. They traded away um, either their best player or second best player from last year's team in Jeremy Grant. And then they basically just went weird from there. Uh, <laughs> they did this bizarre trade with the Knicks where they brought in Alec Burks and Nor- Nerlens Noel, who were going to be on this team. Not really sure why they did that. There they are. And then they, of course, pulled off all the draft day stuff to get Ivy and Jalen Duran. They bring back Marvin Bagley for way too much money. They sign Hawks legend Kevin Knox, and then they run it back with all the young guys from last year. Your Cades, of course, Sadiq Bey, Isaiah Stewart, etc. It's a really weird team. They have a lot of talent, and uh, you know, a lot of it's like twenty-two and under talent. So, like, who knows how good they're going to be? They should be fun. Yeah, I mean, what, what's what what what's kind of cut through everything here? They basically have, I'd say, four players right now who really matter to what this team is going to be. Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, Sadiq Bey, Jalen Duren. I think that is – those are the guys they build around. I mean, I uh, – how, how dare you how, – how dare you leave Martin Mag off that list? How dare you? I thought you – and here I thought you were going to make an Isaiah Livers joke, Brad. Uh, I love – by the way, uh, have you heard this? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trolling you. Have you heard this? Uh, I believe someone in the organization said that he might start at the four. Isaiah Livers. Okay. They got, they got, they got, there was a whole round of reporting on that like two weeks ago. And I was like, maybe they're just saying that. And just for people who don't, don't even know who that is, a former Michigan forward shooter. He played summer league for them. I don't believe he's going to start for them, but he's going to play. And this yeah, is he's going to be, a, he's going to be a, I, 
he's a he's a six seven guy who hits forty percent of his threes. Like he has this, an and this is a, this is a Big Ten podcast after all. But uh, oh, right. I should also mention they still have Kelly Olynyk on this team, who's like a good basketball player. Yeah, so, it's but, all weird, man. But like in the face of that. I actually like. I don't hate the Marvin Bagley decision as much as I you do. do. Uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I know you do. Uh, just because I like. I, I I think everything's still a bit of a free roll of the dice for this team. So that is going true. To, so if you're going to keep a young guy who's talented and theoretically fits really well next to Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey, especially Cade, like I don't hate that. Like. I think Isaiah Stewart is like, I don't know if he's a starting NBA center, but he's a guy who's always going to play really hard and like come off the bench. And, you know, if he's less athletic, Kenneth Fareed, Kenneth Fareed played for a long time. So sure. Why not? Uh, But yeah, for all intents and purposes, Cade, the big thing here is Cade Cunningham making some kind of a big step forward, which, you know, I'm extremely willing to the I'd go as far as say I'm eager to bet that he will do that because I'm just a huge believer in Cade Cunningham. Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran will take their licks as young guys in the league, but I really like both of them. I'm like everyone. I love the Ivy fit next to Cade. And Sadiq Bay is a really nice uh, potential three and D player. Everything else here, you know, I don't want to call, you know, I don't want to say flotsam or anything, you know, like that, but nothing else here matters as much as those guys do. If a guy like Badly or Livers or, you know, one of their other younger dudes hits Killian Hayes still is on the team. Yeah. Like if any of them hits and turns into reliable pro players, that's really great. If you know, their collection of veterans, you know, the guys like, like a Corey Joseph, like a Nerlens Noel, which like, I can't believe I'm calling Nerlens Noel a veteran, but uh, technically he is. Did you under, did I didn't know this until I was looking at this just now. Did, did you happen to know how many years he has played in the NBA? Because you and I are really old. Uh, this is probably year nine for him now. Uh, yeah, he was in yeah. the 2013 draft. 2013 draft. I didn't didn't play his first year because he had the injury, of course, back when on, on your team, Philadelphia Seven Sixers, that I was telling you about before. But no, uh, yeah, the result of being a veteran is weird. But no, I, I'm with you 100 percent on what you said. Like the core pieces are the core pieces. You know, I, there's been this weird thing where I think. This might be blast, but I think Sadiq Bay is like maybe a little bit overrated at this moment, at this very That's moment, fair. just because of like he's been he's had kind of the all you can eat platter of shots. I like Sadiq Bay too. It's just like he's obviously the least, um, I don't know, least upside for sure of those guys. But I, I'm tempted to say he's still in that group though. To your point, like it's the it's the three young guys, Cade, uh, Ivy, Duran, and then Bay for sure, and then. You could argue for Stewart if you like him a lot. You could argue if you still believe in Killian Hayes. I, I don't think m- 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 many people do at this point in time. They paid Bagley like he might be that guy. Uh, you know, the, the counter on Martin Bagley is he's 23 years old still. Yeah. So there's, I, I still like the, I think they're going to be tempted to play him, which is my, that's more my concern. Because uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're fine with paying him. It's playing him that you have an well, issue with. Because like he doesn't really fit with Duran, he yeah. doesn't really fit with Stewart either. So it's like you play him with Olenek, but then you're not playing Stewart or Duran when that when that's happening. So it's a little bit it's a little bit strange. Anyway, we don't have to go full all the way down. But you and I are, are aligned on Cade. We love Cade. Uh, Ivy falling to them at five with no mm-hmm. trade up is such a home run for them. I, I was not like in the ninety fifth percentile of. Jaden Ivy guys in the draft, but getting him at five is a home run. Like it is, yeah. it is what it is. And I, so, I would have really, I don't know about you. I would have loved Keegan Murray on this team, but I like, I think Ivy is just such a great fit next to Cade. That was the thing. And I, and I was honestly, I think, yeah. yeah. And ultimately was, like everything, the, the thing that Matt, you know, I listed those four players who are the ones that think matter. Number one above everything else that matters here is Cade Cunningham. Turns agreed. Into an all-star. So, yeah, no, I mean, uh, you could certainly argue that Ivy has star upside. He does for sure. But I, I, I still would have Cade in a tier or two above him mm-hmm. as a prospect oh, at yeah. this moment. Um, so yeah, the, the number one thing on this, on this roster is what Cade does in year two. Uh, most guys who make that leap have made it in year two or something like that. Year two, year three, something like that. Um, Ivy's going to be bad as a rookie. And that's not a yeah. shot at Ivy. Mm-hmm. The vast, vast majority of rookies are bad and even more so rookie guards who are one and done and you know doesn't he's not a great shooter etc like he does not he has the kind of game of a guy who's not going to have a good, a good rookie season yeah and that's not a, that's not a problem for him it doesn't matter that he's gonna be bad that's, that's the upside of this team not being very good this year but like 
you know, a guy who was the better prospect. Like, Trey Young had kind of a disastrous rookie season in some ways, like performance wise. He showed things and we all kind of saw it, but like his efficiency numbers were terrible. And that's, that's what happens for rookie guards. But if Cade becomes a star this year, yeah. that is the number one thing that had to happen. So we're on the same page there for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, maybe uh, Jaden Ivey can learn how to shoot from noted guy who is also on this team, Buddy Beheim. <laughs> Oh God in heaven! Uh, but but listen, I'm just gonna say, in January of 2020, I said to somebody that Buddy Bayheim is going to get a cup of coffee in the NBA, and uh, you know it's not official yet, but I am very close to being vindicated. And he's on a two way. Like, their, their two ways are Buddy Bayheim and Braxton Key. What a bizarre <laughs> duo of players! If you oh, are a college, yes. college basketball person like like Bill and I are, but no, this stuff Hamdou Diallo. This this is a team that just had a lot of they have a lot of guys, a lot of guys yes. on this team. Uh, it's it's a lot of guys who, you know, Buddy Bayheim has a very, very good skill in his shooting. Javi Diallo has a very, very good skill in his athleticism. Like what they're banking on is that these very good skills are going to be a thing that opens a door to something else. And if it doesn't, oh, well, you're not banking your entire franchise on Hamidou Diallo working out. Uh, he may not even play at all. We'll see. All right, right, we'll move on from there. Uh, last team in this division is the Indiana Pacers, who uh, are clearly rebuilding now. Um, they had mm-hmm. kind of a – I'm not even sure how to put it. They had kind of a season that, like, made them rebuild. Like, early in the year last yeah. year, they were unlucky in point differential versus record, and they lost a bunch of close games. Um, they ended up trading Sabonis in a deal that everyone would have done. Uh, even mm-hmm. even even if you're high on Sabonis and low on Halliburton, that's a deal that Indiana had to make, and they made it. Um, that helps them long term for sure. But like, Miles Turner is on the team as we record this. Still, I don't know what's happening there. Buddy Hill's on this team, but for the most part, they are rebuilding. They traded Brogdon. Um, they lose TJ Warren. Ricky Rubio's gone after he got swapped there. Um, you know, they bring in Ben Matherin. That's the headliner of the offseason for them. Besides just the overall teardown, because look, this is a team right now where their best prospect is Tyrese Halliburton. Mm-hmm. Their next best prospect, you would imagine, by their investment in him is Ben Matherin. That's they're hoping for their backcourt to be that long term. They still have Chris Duarte, who isn't he's a very old prospect, but he is a prospect still. So I mean th- there's a reason why Indiana has a very bad projection. Uh, it's actually been bet down. It's at 23 and a half wins. That's a very bad basketball team. They have more talent than that right now on the team. Like if they have Miles Turner and played him every night and Buddy Heel, like they're better than this, I think 23 and a half mm-hmm. wins. But like, I think they're betting on people like them selling those guys at some point. Yeah, right? I mean, there was there was the report that uh, came out of Indiana, and I believe was confirmed by some folks in Los Angeles that they're one of the teams that was inter- interested in. I, God, I don't even want to say interested in the deal with Russell Westbrook because they weren't. They were interested in uh, betting against the future of the Los Angeles Lakers right. by getting <laughs> a pair of draft picks, and you know, maybe they would. Uh, not even maybe. Like I would wager that after that they. Would just buy Westbrook out and uh, oh, free, you know, one hundred percent chance. There is, I will, I will go yes. on record here. I, I might look stupid, old Texas Bills, whatever. There is a one hundred percent chance if they trade for Russell Westbrook, he's not playing for them. Yeah, no but chance. I, but I think that shows like just where the priorities lie for this team. Like, yeah. you, you know, even Chris Duarte is a twenty-five-year-old sophomore in the NBA. That you know. He, he still has potentially a decade of basketball ahead of him. It's not yes. like it's not like they need to do anything to win right now. They have two guys who I think could help them win basketball games right now, Buddy Heald and Miles Turner, and they were very happy to trade both. Miles Turner has been on the trade block for seemingly my entire life. Well, and he, he's John Col- him, like, him and him yeah. and John Collins should form their own franchise in Seattle, play together. They fit great together. But no, it's I look at the roster right now and their and their cap sheet right now. This is almost almost funnier. Their four highest paid players on the team for this season are as follows: Buddy Heald and Miles yes. Turner are the only guys making more than nine million dollars on this team. This can, year right can I now. can I guess the next two? Absolutely, Jalen Smith and T.J. McConnell. Uh, McConnell is one of them. Smith is not. Uh, Daniel Tice is on this roster, oh, making. Eight point seven million dollars. So, like, their top four guys are those four guys. And listen, uh, Turner is in a different class as a player than the other than the other three guys. And he'll still he'll still a good player too. But like, that tells you where they are as a team. Like, they're mm-hmm. not when when two of your four guys that you're paying the most money to 
are bench guys who they kind of just got. Like McConnell, they, they, they love McConnell there. He's in, he's a guy. He's been around there for a while. But Tice is a throw-in to make the money work on the Brogdon deal. Uh, Turner and Heald are obviously very available. And Jalen Smith, to your point, they just signed. But, like, they signed him to a very cheap contract. It's a speculative deal. They have guys like yeah. Aaron Neesmith on this team. They have Isaiah Jackson still, who they actually like. Um, first round pick from two years ago. Um, Andrew Nemhard was the 31st pick in the draft. Like most of this roster is just like totally future facing. And that's that's what it should be yeah. at this point. And you know, we kind of mentioned it in you know a second ago with the Pistons, but like the things that matter here, one, can Tyrese Halliburton become an all-star? Yep. Two and three, can Benedict Benedict Matherin and Chris Duarte be good NBA players? And then after that, it you know, nothing Isaiah else Jack- really matters. You, you could argue yeah. Isaiah Jackson, who, who they do like, and he was a first round pick. Like I've never been as yeah. high, but there's people that up there, especially that I trust that think he's good. So I, I, okay. I do, I do believe that, but that's at a lower level. He's like, he's like the Sadiq Bay for them. Like Bay is better than, Bay, I want to be clear. Bay is better than Isaiah Jackson, but he's like mm-hmm. the fourth guy on the, on, he's, he's clearly the fourth guy. They do like him, but yeah, I mean, Miles Turner is their best player right now. Other, other than, other than Halliburton, but yeah. like he, they're, don't they have to trade Miles Turner? Like, what are we, what are we even doing here at this point? Like, Maybe not. Well, I mean, this expired. There's, there's, there, there's the other, the other thing that we haven't mentioned, Brad. They signed. They had put an offer sheet in front of DeAndre Ayton, and he signed it. And the entire situation there was very weird. Very. Like they, I, I, I don't even know what the hell happened. Like it didn't. I mean, it they, almost seemed like. It seemed like they were doing like let's call a spade a spade. It looked like they were doing the sons a favor. Yeah, almost. it really did. It really it was it was bizarre in that they didn't um without going crazy into it, like they didn't do all of the tricks that you do to make a right. team not match. Like they didn't give him the player option. It wasn't like the trade kicker and the late payments right. or it, it wasn't it wasn't stuff. like they were trying to like they were trying to structure the deal he was signing, so yeah. it would have like really hurt Phoenix. And, and also, they still turn on the roster. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing. Like now, you have to turn around if you're Indiana's management and say, "Oh, Miles, you know, we know we just tried to sound DeAndre, DeAndre Ayton at the same position, but right. you're still our guy." Like, and the know. thing, like I thought, I think Ayton would have been a magnificent fit. Yeah. Even, how about oh, you you try to do it. Wonder- no, trust yeah. me. I mean, I'm not even the biggest Aiden guy. I definitely would have tried that as Indiana because what else are you doing? And he's really young. You could still rebuild with him. Sure. Like, why not? Yeah. But, and uh, like now that now they're in a spot where like it's, you know, they just seem primed to say Tyrese, Ben, uh, Chris, like take your lumps, grow together next year. I, this upcoming season, like we're going to be bad. We accept it. If it leads to us getting Victor Wenbamiyama, if it leads to us getting Scoot Henderson, like <laughs> if it leads to us getting Doug Eddard, like whatever happens, happens. But like <laughs> right now, our priority is not winning basketball games. Our priority is trying to put something together and, you know, build in a way that the Pacers never really have. The Pacers have never been a team for tanking and trying to get talent through the draft. They've always bet really heavily on their internal development, but you know, now Rick Carlisle's here and they, and I never tabbed him for a guy who would want to see this sort of thing through, but this seems to be the direction they're going to want to go in. Yeah. This is the first time, uh, at least in your life, maybe, maybe my life too, that uh, they are really doing this. Like they, they mm-hmm. have not, they famously have not picked in the top 10 since like 89 until this mm-hmm. year. And now, you know, it is what it is, but uh, no, I'm interested to see what they do. I, I like Ben Matherin, who I know you enjoy as well, and Love him. we'll see how that all goes for Indiana. Uh, all right, that's enough on the Central Division. Bill, thank you for joining me once again on uh, part two of this podcast extravaganza between the two of us. Please plug yourself and all of what's happening. You and I, during recording of this podcast, wrote about Shohei Otani and the Angels. So that there's something, there's something, there's something like that. Right happening. Brad, what did you write about Shohei Otani and the Angels? Uh, the the Angels, as a, I, I, I kind of spoil it now. I guess it's not people. People are going to hear us till later. The Angels hit seven home runs and lost today. We, uh, you know, seven uh, home runs. The 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 joke that uh, Nick Friedel was on the Bulls suck beat. I think Uprock Sports is perpetually on the Angels suck beat. 
So, I mean, it's, uh, it never stops. No. So, no, it, yeah. you, you know, they make our lives easy. Uh, yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter at Build of Filippo, follow everything we have going on at Uprock Sports and Dime. If you're a Penn State fan uh, and you want to listen to Penn State podcast that I am on, uh, the site Roar Lions Roar. Uh, but most importantly, everyone be nice to Brad. He's very good. Uh, if you want to listen to all Tim Frazier podcast content, you can check out Bill's. Are, are, are you proud of me that while we were talking about the Cavs, I didn't bring up Lamar Stevens? A little bit. Yeah, I was surprised <laughs> I didn't uh, Famously, Tim Frazier uh, owns State Farm Arena, and Lamar Stevens once dunked in a very meaningful fashion for the Cavs down the middle of the lane against the Hawks. So Walk off. Uh, all those things, <laughs> it was a walk-off dunk. All right, ask everybody else. Please subscribe to the show. Check out Bill's content, and we'll see you all next time.